be talking about this um, in this series, is that along with the favor of God comes provision. And, and what you're going to start seeing these individuals as we look through the Bible about the favor of God working in people's lives, you, you could, if you had the wrong motives, um, think that I'm going to go after the favor of God for selfish gains. Selfish gains. And James talks about that. James talks about just going, you know, you got the favor of God on you, you know, God, God's grace is on you. I'm going to go to such and such town, make a bunch of money, buy, sell, do this. He goes, no, only if the Lord wills. And then he also says, you have not because you ask not, but then you ask awry that you might, um, see, I'm not, I wasn't planning on saying this, and that you might, uh, um, um, Consume it on yourself, right? And as you see through all these characters in the Bible that the favor of God came upon, prosperity and provision came, but that was not what they were seeking. It, that's, that's just a fruit of God working in your life. That's not what we're seeking after. We're seeking, we're seeking for kingdom change. We're seeking to see people transformed. We're seeking to see God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, so I just want to throw that out there. We're not even to that point yet. But I just don't want you to think, I don't want you to miss out on what God has for your life because you're self-centered. You're, you're selfish, and you're just thinking about what's in it for me. I know none of you guys have ever been that way. But I just, from my own experience, because sometimes in life you're just self-centered. Sometimes you're thinking about how is this going to work out, what's going to be best for me in this situation. But I've learned I've learned from experience that once you, you find what God is calling and telling you to do, no matter if it looks crazy in your natural mind, even looks like it's gonna, there's no way this is going to work out, that, you know, forgiving someone that's done you wrong or, or um, lending or, you know, giving without expecting back in return, being a giver, all of those things. It's foolishness to the natural man. But I've seen time and time again, when you are walking in the favor of God, you can't help but prosper. But again, you're not doing it out of seeking. That's just a fruit of you being a tool, instrument used by the kingdom of God. Because we got a mission here at Karis New Testament Church. We, we, didn't, we're not one of the, we didn't just start Karis here six years ago just so uh, we could get together and feel good on Sunday mornings. We, we want to be used mightily by the hand of God to transform this community and the surrounding communities. Why not? Let's just take over the whole thumb of Michigan. Amen. We got a mission. And a little background on this because you're probably starting to hear some of this terminology coming out if you're um, listening to voice, you know, preachers and teachers, um, especially if you're listening to the Karis Bible College out there, um, these kind of terms um, come into light. And what's interesting is, is, like Pastor Tom said earlier, how these voices are all starting to line up. They start lining up. But the first time I talked about this vision, that the way it's worded today, um, was probably close to uh, maybe eight to ten years ago, I, uh, we were in a leadership group, me and Pastor Tom together, and the terminology I used at that time was that I envision a church as a city within a city. I, I envision the church within a city, within a community, but it's, it's just as vibrant, it's just as a living, it's a, it's a beehive of activity constantly. It's, it's, it's the heart of the city. And that there's all these different areas that the church could be a blessing to the community. Not only be a blessing to the community, but employ and, and, and be a blessing to individuals. And, and I never heard anybody talk about it. So I didn't really talk too much, say too much about it. But God knows my insecurities. So he, as I sought after God, and I, and I was just seeking for more and more of his will in this earth and what he's doing, um, especially through the grace movement, and um, to understand that, uh, that he's empowered us to be world changers through the grace of Jesus Christ. 
I, I ran across the, the seven mountains. And it's like, this, this, guy's, this guy's teaching what I've been having in my heart for the last eight years. And then I didn't really know the guy very good. So I'm thinking, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this is really, uh, if, 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 really, you know, I need two or three witnesses on this. I, I just don't want to jump into something that I've never seen before, never heard before, without um, having people that I, that I strongly um, um, uh, love their, their, their integrity and, and ministry. And then all of a sudden, the guy that I found, uh, Lance Walno, Wal Walnu, he's invited to Karis Bible College to be a, a teacher in, in, in their business school. And then he brings the seven mountains, which the seven mountains is the spheres of influence in the earth. And now we see that, you know, the foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ, but you know what I mean, the, the, the doctrine and teaching that, that we subscribe to here through Karis Bible College is now, um, they're putting their stamp on that, and you're seeing the, the, uh, the mountains showing up in their information. It's amazing how God works. It's amazing how God works. And listen to, if, if this, this church wasn't even, when God put that in my heart, this church wasn't even in my heart yet. I didn't even know. So some of you got, uh, I'm not going to get done with the message today either. Some, some of you, God's put things in your heart, and you're thinking, why is it, what is that? What is that desire that I have in my heart? You know, I, I'm not even in a position to cause that, to, to, for God to even cause that to happen in life. And some of you have been sitting there with those things, and it's just because you're not ready to trust him for the next step yet. See, in my heart, I, I, I never seen starting ministry in Basser, Michigan, <laughs> in my backyard where I grew up. Grew up. You know, I, I always thought a big city or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with little cities, but that's just my own, that was what I envisioned until one day I was finally ready and I'm sitting on the porch talking to God and, you know, what, what do you want? What do you want, God? And he says, why not here? Why not now? So simple. It's just so simple. And I got up and I walked in and told my wife, I, I think God, God said, why not here? Why not now? I think he wants that we're supposed to start something right here where we're, where we're at. And I go, and she, she, and soon as, soon, soon as, soon as I verbalized that, soon as it came out of my mouth, my heart turned. My heart turned. And when my heart turned, faith came. And my wife goes, you know, so what are you thinking? Because, <laughs> you know, she, I can get a little... I'm the gas, she's the brake, uh, which is good because if you didn't have brakes, you'd go off the cliff, right? I said, and then my carnal mind kicked in. I said, well, 52, 52 weeks, because we were serving in a church, and we didn't, we wanted to leave, we wanted to step out of ministry, we wanted to do things right and honorably, and um, within... <laughs> I got one of these days. I got to sit down and write down a timeline on this because it was like two to three three months. We have bought, we bought the building and we had our first service. When you step into God's favor, when you step into what He's called you to, when you when you say yes to the calling of God, when you stop pushing down the desires of your heart that God has put in there, and when you take a step and speak it out of your mouth and start to walk in that direction, God's favor will come upon your life, and you will, things that you think is going to take a year takes three months. You know, we did it completely wrong. I talked to people. 
They said, well, why did you start a church there? Because God told me to. Well, they didn't like that answer. You're supposed to study. You're supposed to see where a church is needed. You know, there's 13 churches in Vassar. Do we need another one? I don't know. I guess God thought we did. I did it all wrong. You're supposed to get a team together. You're supposed to have a whole team together, um, start planning, doing little outreach, let people know in the community what's going on, all that stuff. We had a building before we had one member. Or one, you know, we didn't have a team. I had my family. It doesn't need to make sense. You don't need to do it the way, God's way. You just, or you don't need to do it God's way. You need to do it God's way. You don't need to do it the way that the world tells you. And I'm not saying that that wisdom and knowledge is you throw it away. But if God's telling you to do something, you do it. And are we to where I envision that we are going to be? No. But that just means we're not, we're not ready yet. And I've said this before. If 500 people, if we had revival and 500 people showed up at our, at our church, are we ready for that? Are we ready for 10 people to show up? Are we ready to show them unconditional love of God, to show them the same grace that we have received, to love them and make them feel part of the body of Christ? You guys do an awesome job. One of the... One of the Am I going to preach my message today? One, one, of the, one, of the, one of the greatest things that I hear about, about, you, about you guys is that just how welcoming. That there's just, a, as soon as people come in here, there's, there's, a, there's a presence. And it just feels welcoming. That's awesome. You'd be surprised at, at how many churches that, they, that it feels cold when, people, when visitors come in there. And that... That's all you guys. That has nothing to do with me. I wish I could take credit for it. But we're one of the best kept secrets in the thumb. And we, the word's going to get out there sooner or later. And we've got to be ready for the people to come in. So our mission, okay, slide number one. Our mission is to proclaim and expand the kingdom through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that God's not mad at you. He's not even in a bad mood. Jesus paid the price. Your whole past is gone. All you have is an awesome future in Jesus. Now let's get together and let's find the purpose of God for your life. He has a blueprint for you, for your life. You know, a lot of us were building homes. We were building lives that, with no blueprint. And no wonder they're cockeyed. You know, wonder, wonder why they're falling apart. Maybe there's cracks in the walls. But God has an awesome blueprint. He has a design on your life, and he wants to achieve it. He has a design on this church, and we got to make sure that we follow his blueprint and not ours. So how, how are we going to take the gospel and change the world, expand the kingdom of God? By activating up, you and me. In the grace and the wisdom of Christ. See, it's not enough just to have God's grace, God's favor, God's ability on your life. You have to have the wisdom of how to use it. Right? You have to have the wisdom of how to use it. Joseph, he had God's grace on his life, right? He prospered. He's in Potiphar's home. He, was, he, he had so much favor on him. Potiphar's wife wanted him. But he has the wisdom to run. I'm getting ahead of my, of my message. But a lot, of, a, lot of times, a lot of times, God's not able to put more favor on your life is because you haven't, your character isn't to the point where you could handle it. Your character... If God put more favor on your life where people were attracted to you, where, pe where people um, were willing to work with you, it can destroy you. So God wants to take the wisdom of Christ. He wants to take the grace of Christ, and he wants to put it on us so when we go into our vocation, which our calling, that's the spiritual way of talking about it, but the world calls it a vocation, what you do, what you do, what you, what you do in life, to their location. That's, the, that's, that, that's your mountain. That's that sphere. That's that gate of the city. That's that place where P 
people are coming, that you are interacting with people on a daily basis, and you're affecting the situation with the kingdom of God because you have the grace and the wisdom and the favor of God on your life. And those gates, those, those spheres, those mountains are religion, family, business, government, education, media, celebration, arts, and entertainments. These are mountains of influence. They are gates of the city. They are cultural, cultural shapers. And there are a war. There's a war going on in these areas of life. Every single one of those areas, you can see the kingdom of darkness warring against the kingdom of light. Every single one. And we have to decide, are we going to be of this world or just in this world? Are we going to be of the kingdom of darkness or are we going to be of the kingdom of light? Are we going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because there's a lot of things that seem good to man's way of thinking. You know, working hard, penance, praying hard doing a bunch of good works, seem like a good idea to earn God's favor. Doesn't it? It sounds like a good idea. There's so many religions based on it. But it's not God's way. It's man's way. God's way is the way of grace. God's way is the way that he lays down his life. You do not lay down your life. He came to give dead people life. Now ask... Uh, people with life to die for him. That is, I guarantee you, not, probably 80, 90% of the world does not know that that's what Christianity is about. They think Christianity has something to do with the Ten Commandments. They think Christianity has to do something with keeping some rules. Christianity's about trying not to stay on God's good side. You know, God doesn't have a bad side. So we're supposed to be eating from the, not from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. We're supposed to be eating from the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is that tree of life. And we have to filter our worldview. We have to filter the way that we work in religion, family, business, government, education, media, celebration. We have to filter that through the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And in Luke chapter 26, we see God ready to do a major work in the world, and he does it through putting his favor on a little peasant girl. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, to, by God, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, considering what manner of greeting this was. I said this last week, but it needs to be said again. She, she wasn't troubled that there was an angel there. She was troubled at the greeting. Highly favored me? Blessed among women? Me? She must have never, ever heard that before. It never entered her mind that she was highly favored. It would never entered her mind that she was blessed among women. That never entered to, into her heart. And I'm here to tell you that there's some of you that feel that way about your life. You don't feel like you're very really highly favored, that you're not ble blessed, that you're nothing special. But I'm telling you, God looks at people different than the, earth, the world looks at people. God sees people different. He sees on the inward heart. He, he's seen something in Mary. He's seen something in Mary. You know, the question is, is what would happen if Mary said no? You know what? I think God knew her heart enough that he, he, could, he went to, the, to Mary, the, Mary and he knew that she'd say yes. Because he knew her heart. Favor marks you. It sets you apart. 
It sets you apart. God puts his favor upon you, and, 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 he, and just like Mary, he impregnates you with a purpose, with a destiny, with something that he wants to manifest in the earth. He wants to birth in the earth. And I'm, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you need to know that when we go through these great men of faith, these great women of faith, and you think, well, these were great men. These were great women of faith. You know what? You're in Christ Jesus. As he is, so are you in this world. You are qualified. You are qualified for the favor of God to rest upon your life. This was God's plan from the beginning. This was his mystery hidden in Christ Jesus, that the glory of God would be revealed in our earthen vessels, us. Not what? There's not one of you that are in Christ Jesus here today that God is not desiring for his favor to just come down on you. His anointing. Anointing is not just for the preacher up here. Yes, it is for the preacher up here, but it's not just for here. It's for every single child of God to be anointed. What does that mean? What does anointed mean? That's a spiritual word that we use. It means to be slathered up. It means to be poured upon. It means if you were to take butter and just butter somebody all up so they're nice and shiny, you just anointed them. And God wants to do that with, to you with his grace and favor. Think about that. Think about Let that sink in, that God wants to butter you up so that, so, so that the things of this world can't stick to you. They just slide right off. He wants to butter you up so you, you just, you, you, you're just... Tasty to the, to, to, to the world. That people can't, you're irresistible. He wants, to, he wants to just lather you up with his favor. G Mary was highly favored. See, every, God loves everybody in the world. We talked about this. And we got to get this through our heads because a lot of us, this is the first time we've ever heard any teaching on anything like this. This might be brand new to you. So we, we, we might as well go slow. We might as well repeat ourselves a little bit. But God loves everybody with the agape of God. The agape of God is different from man's love. Most of man's love is based in what it does for me. I love hamburgers because they're good. Right? A cheeseburger anointed with a bunch of cheese and bacon. But we love it because of what it does for us. But that's not the way that God's love works. God's love is, love is the commitment of one's will. It's not a gooey feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a commitment. It's a will. I will to love you. I will for your life to prosper. I will for your life to, to, to be blessed. Love is the commitment of one's will to use their energy and resources to invest in the best possible outcome for another's sake, independent of what it does for him, them. Re Romans. We use this scripture quite often, but you guys don't believe it yet, so I got to keep Going to it till, till faith comes. Romans 8.32, it says, He, speaking of God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That sounds just like that definition I just read there. He, he uses his, his resources, he uses his power, he uses his energy, for the best possible outcome of your life. The biblical term would be charity or benevolence. See, God loves everybody. God agapes everybody. God wills the best for everybody. But not everybody is too likable. He doesn't like everybody. We talked about this. Because you, like, you can love somebody, want the best for them, Get, put all your energy and effort into ha that they would have success in life, that they'd be blessed, that they would prosper. But if they're not working with you, if they're working against you, and we, we, that it's hard to like that. 
I mean, God says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's impossible to please God without faith. So when you are doubting God, you're not very pleasing. But does that mean that he stops loving you? No. He has a, he, he, he has a million different ways he's going to try to get it to you. He's going to try to turn your heart to see that he loves you, to trust him with reckless abandonment. I mean, Psalms chapter 7, verse 11, it says, God is angry with the wicked every day. Why is he angry with the wicked every day? Is it because he doesn't love them? No, it's exactly why he's angry. It's because he loves them. And he wants the best for them. And he knows that the way that, the, of, that they're going leads to death. It leads to destruction, not only of themselves, but of humanity. God loves everybody. But he doesn't like everybody. Why? Because he, think about this. The only thing that God, what really gets God going is when you allow him to bless you. When you allow him to do the work. When you allow him to work through your life. When I say allow him to do the work, I'm talking about you, the, the fear, the anxiety, the stress, all of that just melts away and you just go to work for the kingdom of God trusting that he gives the increase, that he does it. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, Israelites were up against the Red Sea, right? And they were all screaming. They were all, what's what are we going to do? Even Moses was upset. Set. And he said, stretch out your hand and watch the salvation of the Lord. Moses had to stretch out his hand. But the Moses, uh, but but God took care of the rest. Some of us aren't even willing to stretch out our hands. Some of us aren't willing to get out of the boat. Some of us aren't even willing to ask God, what's your will for my life? So you got Mary that is highly favored. You got Daniel who is greatly beloved we talked about last, last week. And those that that are partnering with God, those that desire God's will to be done in their life, the favor of God comes on them. The favor of God means that God is fond of you. He really likes you. When he likes you, then there is an influence that comes upon you where the very charisma of Christ rubs off on you. The word Christ and anointing is the same exact word. The anointed one, Christ, Messiah, they're all the same word. And it makes others like or cooperate with you whether they like to or not. And you're going to see this in Scripture. If your success depends on other people getting along with you, receiving you, or liking you, this message is for you. And all of us are dependent on that. We're all dependent on that. Are you a business person? You're a mother? You're a student? Are you breathing today? This message is for you. You need the favor of God in operation in your life, and that's every single person in this room. You belong to one of those spheres of influence in our world, and we need the favor of God upon us. So let's look at the favor and how it causes success. We seen last week Jesus In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. See, it's just, you, this is not just a one-time thing. It says he kept increasing. We should be going from glory to glory. We should be going from favor to favor. We should be increasing in our favor. We should be increasing in the wisdom of God. Right? The more favor that you have, the more wisdom you're going to need to do, use it. Right? What's the sense of having the opportunity but not knowing what to do when you get there? That's why you need wisdom. Favor can go two ways. We talked about favor with God and favor with man. You can have favor with God but be a jerk to people, not be very pleasant, not have a good personality. 
And then you have other people that have the favor, or favor with man on them, but God's not pleased with them because they're, not, they're doing everything in their own strength. You, you, you might be thinking today, why, why is it, if this favor of God is, is, is this supernatural ability to get people to work with you, to have influence in the world, why does non-believers and even evil people seem to have great favor? You ever think about that? Right? You ever think about it? Why, why, why do movie stars have great favor? They, you might think, well, they don't have no favor. Yes, they do. They have huge sway, especially on young people. Why? Do you remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Temptation? And the devil came and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. See, there's a difference between a kingdom and a nation. The kingdoms are the principalities. The kingdoms are these spheres of influence that, on, on men's hearts. He showed them all these spheres of influence, these kingdoms of the world, and he says, all these have been given to me, and I give to whom I will. If all you do is bow down and worship me. See, there's these two kingdoms at war, the kingdom of gar darkness and the kingdom of our God. So God, so the devil, the devil he anoints people. He, he gives influence to people just like God does. Why does he do that? So that he can create his purposes in the earth. But the good thing is, is our God is greater. Our God is stronger. We sung it this morning. And your favor outshines, outperforms, obliterates the favor that Satan has to offer. So that's, does that answer the question? Does that make sense to you? Satan, what, 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 what uh, Satan didn't realize is that when Jesus refused to bow down and worship him, that Jesus already knew he was going to get it. He was going to get all the kingdoms of the world. And it was through death on a cross. It was through serving. It was through, through laying down his life. So let's look at, again, let's look at men and women that uh, you see the favor of God operating in their life. Um, because can you just imagine what would happen if, if our church was continually growing and increasing in, the, in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man? Can you imagine what would happen in, in your life, in your workplace, in your family, if you were continually increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man? Can you imagine what would happen? Let's look at Esther. Do you, do you know the story of Esther? The king uh, wanted Queen Vashti to dance for him, and she refused to dance for him. So the king decided, I need a new queen. I need a new queen. He kicked Vashti out, and they basically paraded a, a bunch of... See, this is very interesting, and I won't go into what we think is moral and immoral, but it's very interesting when you read the story of Esther, how she became queen. She had a sleepover with the king, and she won. You don't hear that story preached in church, do you? It's interesting. But anyways, we won't talk about that. Go home and read it. See, I just struck your interest. There's a bunch of you just going to go home and read the story now. In Esther chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abahel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as daughter, came to go to the king. She did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to the king, to his royal palace in the tenth month, which is in the month of Tibeth, whatever that is, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him 
more than all the virgins, so that she, so that he set her, oh my goodness, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all the princesses, princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. It was favor. It was the favor of God that caused this to happen. She had favor on her. Not only did she have the favor, but she had, had that emotional connection that she received the king's kindness. It is the charisma of Christ that makes you appealing in the spiritual and in the natural. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter your education. What matters if the, is if the spirit of God's favor is resting upon you, is resting upon you. There is not a character in the Bible that accomplished anything that we do not see this char- the same characteristic of the favor of God resting upon them. Look, let's look at Daniel. In, Dan- in Daniel chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion, the same thing, in the sight of the commander of the officials. Think about this. Daniel is, is, is from a conquered people. He was a Jewish boy. The Babylonians conquered him. They brought him back into captivity. The Babylonian captivity. He was a conquered person. They were despised people. He was in a foreign country. And he was a minority. In the life of Daniel and Esther, you see how favor will take the downtrodden, the lesser, and promote them. You see that with Joseph. We haven't got to him yet. He was in a prison. The favor of God raised Daniel to the second in command, the vice president, the prime minister of the Babylonian kingdom, a Jew that was in captivity, the lesser. It's amazing. We don't read it this way. We think that Daniel was just something, something special. Yeah, he was special. He was special to God. He decided to do things God's way. He didn't collapse and, for, and, and change his worldview into the Babylonian system. He continued to believe God. He completed, continued to trust God. He continued to follow God's ways, even to his own hurt, where, where he refused to eat what was offered to idols, he was refused to eat meat. And they were shocked that him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that were not getting the nourishment that all the rest of them were getting, was stronger, had a better complexion. They had, they had more energy. So we know what that means. That means that we're supposed to have a Daniel diet. I said this last week, but I need to say it again. We take the, the super, we take the favor of God and we try to put it in a formula of something we can do in the flesh. It had nothing to do with him just eating fruits and vegetables. Because they were surprised that he was doing better. The majority of the population only had fruits and vegetables. Meat was reserved for the palaces, the kings. They were shocked that he was doing better and not eating as good as they were. So it has nothing to do with physical things. It has nothing to do with a special diet. It has to do with the favor of God resting on an individual. But he was a slave, and he's in the second command. He was the vice president, and he ruled through four separate kings. Four separate kings came into Babylon, and Daniel was there for all four separate kings, second in, second in command. Through the rule of four separate empires, Daniel stays in the number two spot his entire life. Why? Because God granted Daniel favor and compassion. There was a spirit of attraction and affection on Daniel. 
And God wants that to be on you. Here's a little information for you. Did you ever wonder where the uh, Magi that came from the east, how they knew about the star and, and, the, and the coming Messiah? Daniel. Daniel is the one that received the prophecies. Remember? Go, go read Daniel. So they had all these prophecies in Babylon and Persia. They were waiting for the Messiah because this one guy, this little slave boy that refused to do things the Babylonian way, but, but to believe God and to do spiritual warfare, got a prophecy from God. And thousands and thousands of years later, the Babylonians, the Persians, the, 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 those of the East still honored his teachings, his prophecies, his words that they were willing to pick up when they seen it come into pass and go find it. That's amazing. That's amazing. See, this is the secret to Daniel. This was the secret to Esther. This was the secret to David. This was the secret to Joseph. Can you see that we need to learn to walk in the favor of God and man? If you can walk in the favor with God and man, you can have massive influence on your world and accomplish what God has called you to do in this earth. But you can't be selfish. You can't be self-centered. You, you got to be willing to be a servant. You got to be willing to be used. We're not. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about going, to, going to heaven or not going to heaven. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. I'm talking about <laughs> accomplishing what He's prepared for us to do here on earth. See, the reason why most of us have never heard a teaching on the favor of God is because. We have been taught an escape mentality that once you get saved, all you do is sit, grip the front of the pew, and suffer and go through it until you either step over to the other side or Jesus comes back. That doesn't sound like victory to me. No, we, we are called, as Pastor Tom to say, to the harvest. We are called to see God manifest himself through fools. That the glory of God would be revealed through average people like us. So that they look at, at you and they say, it's got to be God. It's got to be God. The church needs a dose of favor, especially in this day and age, where most people think that church is irrelevant. We need a dose of God's divine favor. We need to increase in the favor with God, and we need to increase in the favor with man. We need to be the head and not the tail. See, when you're the head, you know where you're going. When you're the tail, you're carried by the head. The Bible says that, God, that God's people are to be the head, not the tail. We are called to lead and have influence in society. And it's, going to, it's supposed to be positive influence, not ne negative influence, because we got a message called good news. When people hear our message, they should go, woohoo, that's good news. But in, unless they just sold themselves off to the kingdom of darkness altogether, then they're going to war against you. See, we are to initiate things. The church needs to be initiating the change and, 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 and the revelant, revel, revel, relevance, relevance, that's the word, that is needed in society, that our young people are so hungry for, Life has to be more than sitting on my phone, looking at Instagram, looking at Snapchat. Look, the deadness that is happening in people's hearts because they feel that they're insignificant. When God wants to give every human being on the face of the planet great significance, great significance. We are to initiate things, not be caught up in others' activities. What do I mean by that? Simply this. 
that the church is no, known more for what it's against than what it's for. The church is known more for what it's against than what it's for. Why? Because we're not the head, we're the tail. Culture is taking us somewhere, and so we're in the back condemning where culture's taking us instead of leading from the front. I mean, you guys know my heart. I, I think abortion is an atrocity. You read, it, you read in the scriptures, you read in the scriptures um, of, of when Herod killed all of the children up to three years old trying to snuff out Jesus, the two kingdoms. And you think, what kind of man could possibly do that? You think of Pharaoh that, was, that if it was a boy, they were to throw him in the Nile to the crocodiles. They were, they were to kill him. And you think, what kind? What kind of a man could do that? And then you realize, because we know that those things were written for our sake, and you can see how Pharaoh was a form of the Antichrist, Satan, and the Jews in their captivity was the bondage to sin and death and slavery that we were in, and that you had the kingdom of Egypt, and you had the, and the land of Goshen, that when darkness fell and the plagues came on the kingdom of Egypt, there was light in Goshen. You see that the God's favor rests on the, on the people of Goshen. So no matter how dark it gets out there, continue to be the head because you'll shine bright. And you see how those things were all, those things were all um, just images. They were prophecy. They were, they were glimpses. They were uh, types and shadows of the real story that's happening in humanity. The kingdom of Satan versus the kingdom of God. The kingdom of the knowledge of good and evil versus the kingdom of the tree of life. And you see that you can't look past that and see that, that abortion is not the spirit of Antichrist. Now that being said, so what do we do? Do we do, we do a bunch of marches and rallies to, to, uh, to, try, to try to change it? If I could change it, like that, if I, if I could sign it that's illegal, I would. But that's not how you change society. You change people's hearts. You change people's hearts, and, and, and a person that faces that type of decision that feels hopeless. Why do they feel hopeless? Because the church isn't doing their job. Why do they even have to make that decision? Why is that even a choice? Why is that something that even crosses their mind? It's because we have failed as a church. We spend millions and millions of dollars for legislation. And I'm not trying to be po political here, but I don't care. I don't I don't. Republicans have lied to us for years. They're not interested in changing anything. And the truth of the matter is, is that does that really change anything anyways? Does a law change men's hearts? No. So maybe instead of spending millions of dollars sending it to Washington, why don't we get to our crisis pregnancy centers? And make them state of the art. Make them be an, a lighthouse to, to, to men and w women and men that are faced, that they think that there's no hope to give hope. I'm just, probably get myself in trouble. I don't know. I, I'm just talking off the cuff. But that, that's just one simple thing there. Do you see? We got so much work to do. And you're thinking, Chad, I'm tired. i got enough to do right now. You know what? Once you step in the favor zone, it's not work. And sometimes your flesh will start saying, man, you'll look at what you got to do. You, that you got all this stuff. I, don't, tell, don't tell me you're busy. I'm busy. I got a full-time job. I, I know, I'm not whining, but I just want you to know I know what you're feeling. I got a full-time job. I got four kids that are still in, all in high school or in school. Thank God my wife isn't high maintenance. And 
I'm trying to serve you the best of my ability. But there's a grace, there's a favor, there's, there, there, there's an ability of God that rests upon his people. And we need a dose of favor. We need a dose of favor. We need to be the head and not the tail. It's time that the world knows what the church is for and what it's, than what it's against. I mean, most, most people couldn't even tell you. If you went out on the streets and asked the average person, explain to me what it means to be a Christian, I think you'd be shocked at what they tell you. And if you're not either shocked or, or ashamed, what they would tell you. Well, guess what? We're not going to get to the message today. But that's all right. We're in no hurry, right? We're, we're going to be here next week, right? Until Jesus comes back. So, uh, so we, we'll just take our time. But do you see, I, I hope you're seeing this. If, you, if you've never, if you've never uh, experienced a teaching on favor, but I, I, I hope that you start, that, that the Holy Spirit is giving you revelation, illumination into the things of God. And that you can see that, you know, maybe this dream that I have in my heart isn't so foolish. Maybe it is God-inspired. Maybe... If he, can take, if he can take a slave girl and make her a queen, if he, she can take, he can take a slave boy and make him second in command. See, that's the thing of it is. We think, to, that's the thing about the favor of God is you don't have to be in the number one spot. When you have favor and you have, it gives you the king's ear. Pharaoh told jo, told, said about Joseph, whatever he says, do it. That's amazing. My wife has favor because whatever she says, I do. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but do you see that? Amen. I'll stop talking. But listen, let's just let's just start at, let's start believing for it right now. Everybody, let's just say, Father, give me your favor. I receive your favor. I will be looking for it in this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, be blessed, church. That's our closing prayer. You are lathered up, buttered up in the favor of God, and he's going to do awesome, awesome things through each one of you. Amen.